everyone. In starting out on this topic, we will look at History in English Words by Owen Barfield. And in this context, we will regard the foreword by W.H. Alden. In this passage, we get an understanding of how words are commonly used today in a general sense. Quote, it will always be possible to use language as a demagogue uses it, as black magic, which neither, like a communication code, supplies people with information they need to know, nor, like speech, asks for a personal and therefore unpredictable response, but seeks to extort from others mindless, tautological echoes of itself." End quote. Now this definition essentially governs regurgitation, which is of course the vomiting up of mindless facts and words that were implanted by someone else. Of course, this takes us into the power of words, how they're used and how they can be used, but mainly how they are currently used. Now words we can find directing nearly every level of our modern lives, which are often accompanied by symbols such as a stop sign or a safe word. But also another use for words can be found in popular spy fictions where another spy is activated based off of a phrase or a word. Now these activation words or trigger words can be found in many areas of society, but is most easily identifiable through the use of voice activation and various apps. Now in current conflicts, a certain application was used to incite violence in a literal demonstration of the power of trigger words. Of course, this very plan was laid out in the fictionalized movie The Kingsman, in which a signal was sent out via cellular devices which elicited, which incited violent action. Now, when it comes to modern forms of programming, we must understand the use of words and the role they take. This is a long process, which takes much effort, much time, much patience, and much money to program thoughts, ideas, habits, and patterns into the mind. Now, in The Graves of Academe by Richard Mitchell, we get a good explanation of how this process works. Quote, the consequences of Cattell's discovery have surely been enormous, for they include not only the stupefaction of almost the whole of American culture, but even the birth and colossal growth of a lucrative industry devoted first to assuring that children won't be able to read and then selling an endless succession of remedies for that inability. But Wundt, in, in fact, brought us much worse. He brought us the very atmosphere in which such silliness can thrive. Out of the internal exigencies of his science, he was led to consider education a human phenomenon similar to other human psychic conditions, a conditioned response to stimuli. Teaching had to be seen as the application of stimuli that will elicit whatever response we choose to call learning. Contrarywise, anyone who has learned something to read or cipher, for instance, must obviously have done so as a result of being exposed not simply to the substance of his learning, the reading or ciphering, but to some stimulus that probably, but by no means certainly, was visited upon him somewhere in the vicinity of reading and ciphering. The widespread acceptance of the teaching of reading, as inspired by Cattell, was probably only where there was already a predisposition to concentrate not on the substance of what can be learned, but on some attribute that can be detected in the supposed learner. Exactly that predisposition was provided by one's view of teaching and learning as psychological stimuli and responses, an arrangement presumed to have its own validity without reference to what was taught and learned. This view was gladly received in the United States where, as we will see, a growing educationistic establishment made up mostly of people with little or no academic expertise was looking for attractive alternatives to the constricting demands of subjects. Thus, it is that our educationists prefer not to treat the multiplication table as something that just has to be learned, 
they rather think of multiplying as a desirable student outcome, a behavioral modification of one who does not know how to multiply. This would be only a harmless playing with words if it weren't for the fact that not all students learn to multiply with equal ease. If we simply think of the multiplication table as a set of numbers that must be learned by brute force, we can demand more force of those who fail to learn. If we think of the ability to multiply as a behavioral objective, an appropriate response to stimuli, then the student who doesn't learn to multiply must drive us to seek other stimuli and perhaps, in stubborn cases, to decide that learning the multiplication table has only limited value for the student outcome of multiplication. From such a view, other follies may follow. Now, in a different passage, we get an idea of how we get a practical idea of how this coding takes place. Quote, Before we can begin this research, we have to be clear about some things that might confuse mere laymen. Notice first that whether a teacher is directive or not is not an issue. All that matters is whether a student perceives a teacher as directive. This is child-centered research. Although grades do go into the hopper, it's not because we are interested in what a student has learned or how that can be measured, but because we want to know about our student's satisfaction, which depends only in part on his grade, which must be factored in with his own perception of directiveness and his own student variables. This is still child-centered research. Bearing in mind those warnings, we can now proceed with our research. If we are successful, we can expect to be able to answer questions like this. Who will be more satisfied with a B plus? A moderately intelligent student with better than average convergent divergent ability, but little, if any, focus of control, or a very bright dogmatic student who shows normal achievement orientation, but no compulsivity to speak of, and does not, unlike the first student, perceive the teacher as directive." Now, other practical examples can be found in the exercise of imagining a pen. Of course, the imagining of the pen is not the important part, but simply the compliance to the directive of imagining the pen, giving the director the ability to implant thoughts in the mind of the subject. Of course, in this context, it is only the dictate which is important and not what has been dictated, such as with the Rorschach's compliance test, which solidifies obedience to dictates through the use of images. Of course, when programming, just as with Python or binary, repetition is the key, and it is the same with school and programming of children. An example of this can also be found in the television series Pokemon, in which much repetition of messaging in relation to the LGBTQ plus propaganda, or as it's often referred, drag, is being taught and programmed into the minds of children. But far worse, pedophilic messages and the normalization of such activity is also taking place and being programmed into the minds of children. Of course, we are no strangers to this use of coded messaging as we see words and symbols embodying outward stimuli and used to elicit the proper behavioral outcomes of the public. And the most obvious of this comes with the, the blood thing that shall not be named. Now in Rupert Sheldrake's the presence of the past, morphic resonance, and the habits of nature. We find a passage that describes the current robotic dogma and thought behind, thought behind common understanding of memory. Quote, our memory is stored inside the brain. The traditional idea of memory storage within the brain goes back to classical times. Stimuli falling on the sense organs produce disturbances in the brain which cause the perception of the stimuli. The disturbances leave behind traces, minute changes in the structure of the brain. As a result of these changes, brain activity becomes more likely to follow the same paths again in response to stimuli that are similar or whose traces are intermingled or associated with those of the first stimulus. Of course, this explains how humans are seen as mere robots 
and their brains are computer centers to be programmed and elicit whichever behavioral response is desired by the programmer. Our brains are essentially mind palaces inside of server rooms. However, the consequence of this type of thinking appears to more appears more as a constructed mental prison from which it is very difficult to leave. Now it is not simply enough to use repetition of words and other methods to code behavior into a child it has, without a doubt, not been as effective as intended. Therefore, it is important to use aids in this process. In this way, a person can be mesmerized through the application of drugs. Of course, which agency do we know which has a long track record and experience with the use of drugs in relation to human subjects? Now, this particular use and methodology can be found in the in the realm of learning disorders and behavioral disorders in the school system which require the implementation of drugs or pharmaceuticals to assist the programmer in eliciting the proper behavioral response from the captive subjects